Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In this series of lectures on respiratory physiology we are currently dealing with transport of carbon dioxide in blood this is the second part of that lecture in the previous lecture, we saw how much of carbon dioxide is produced by tissues and put out into blood, the forms in which this carbon dioxide travels in venous blood and the fact that all of what is formed in the tissues is eliminated in the lungs. We also went on to see the alveolar ventilation equation which describes the relationship between these three parameters. The volume of carbon dioxide exhaled is given by the product of alveolar ventilation and percent composition of carbon dioxide in the alveolar gas. For this to qualify as the alveolar ventilation equation, alveolar ventilation should be on the left hand side and VCO2 on the right hand side. But we are interested in this parameter because this is exactly what is formed in the tissues and we are trying to measure that. Now, alveolar ventilation can be measured with a flow meter, a spirometer and that is let us say at 4.2 liters per minute which is a value we will get considering a tidal volume of 500 ml and a dead space volume of 150 ml. Therefore, alveolar volume would be 350 ml per breath multiplied by 12 breaths per minute that is how we get this number. Alveolar carbon dioxide can also be estimated. We will see in detail how this is done later, but in brief, when you exhale, the initial part of your exhalation will be composed entirely of dead space air, which is in the previous breath, if you had taken air in, the atmospheric air would have filled the dead space. And when you exhale, it is purely atmospheric air which comes out initially, then a mixture of dead space air and alveolar air. And finally, pure alveolar air will come out. So, if you estimate carbon dioxide concentration in the last part of exhalation, what is called end expiratory carbon dioxide or end tidal carbon dioxide, it is considered equivalent to alveolar carbon dioxide. That is how this parameter is estimated. If it is 40 millimeter mercury, we see that volume of carbon dioxide exhaled is 200 ml per minute. That is how we would know how much of carbon dioxide is formed in the tissues because that is exactly what is exhaled. All this we considered in the previous session and we ended with a question. What happens if alveolar ventilation reduces? Say the person is not able to breathe for some reason, a fractured rib inhibiting breathing movements. If breathing is impaired and alveolar ventilation, let us say, goes down to half its normal value, what would happen to the amount of carbon dioxide exhaled? Will it reduce? Will it also go down to half that value? That was the question we ended the last session with. When alveolar ventilation is low, is carbon dioxide elimination impaired? The answer to that question is, even if alveolar ventilation reduces, the amount of carbon dioxide exhaled will be the same as that is formed that will not be affected. But the consequence would be that the concentration of alveolar carbon dioxide will go up and if this goes up arterial carbon dioxide will also increase. So, this is an important lesson to learn that even if ventilation reduces Carbon dioxide elimination per se at steady state will not be affected, but what will happen is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the alveolus and therefore arterial blood will increase and we will see later that this will lead to acidosis and that is the problem with hypoventilation. We will see a short video to understand that this is a natural consequence of physics. This is not some biology that causes this phenomenon.
Let this tube represent carbon dioxide output from the body. Notice that there is a pump here which gives a steady output of carbon dioxide. Now let this tubing represent inhaled air. The exhaled air is going out in that tube. But you know that inhalation and exhalation is through the same route. But for demonstration purposes, let this represent exhaled air or alveolar air. So when carbon dioxide goes out into the alveolus, let's think this is the alveolus. It's going to mix with inhaled air and then a certain amount of carbon dioxide will come out in the exhaled air. What we will do now is at the same steady flow of carbon dioxide, which is the ink here, we will see what happens when ventilation is normal, that is the amount of inhaled air is normal, or when ventilation is less. That's the demonstration. The color of the solution here indicates the concentration of carbon dioxide in the exhaled air or in the alveolus. Okay. So what I want you to understand is we have not changed the amount of ink flow that is going as usual and whatever ink flows is cleared off by the ventilation and this is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the exhaled air. We are reducing the rate at which ventilation occurs. I'm just waiting for the dead space to go. Okay, we have reduced ventilation, but we have not changed the amount of carbon dioxide that is flowing into the alveolus. Blood brings in the same amount of carbon dioxide. When flow is reduced, you can already see that the same amount of carbon dioxide flow into the alveolus and into the exhaled air but it is going to be more concentrated. What I want to say is that VCO2 or the amount of carbon dioxide that gets into the alveolus will not change, but the concentration of carbon dioxide in the alveolus and the exhaled air is what is going to increase. So please note the difference in concentration of carbon dioxide as shown by the color of the fluid there. So in the exhaled air, carbon dioxide is going to be more concentrated when ventilation is less. The amount of carbon dioxide injected into the alveolus, that is VCO2, will be exhaled no matter what the ventilation is. But just that, the carbon dioxide concentration in the exhaled air is going to be more. I hope it is clear to you now that when ventilation is halved, the volume of carbon dioxide eliminated will still be the same, whatever is formed in the tissues. But the consequence is that alveolar carbon dioxide concentration will double. Since arterial carbon dioxide is equal to alveolar carbon dioxide, the result would be that there is a doubling of arterial carbon dioxide as well. That is the problem with reduced ventilation. At steady state, whatever carbon dioxide is formed in tissues will be eliminated, but there will be an increase in arterial carbon dioxide concentration because alveolar carbon dioxide equals arterial carbon dioxide. In the normal state, with a PCO2 of 40 and a bicarbonate of 24, pH would be 7.4 and that is given by the henderson hasselbalch equation. <coughs> pH is 6.1 plus log bicarbonate concentration by carbon dioxide concentration. Carbon dioxide concentration is given by that. So, pH is 6.1 plus log 24 by 1.2 which is log 20 and therefore pH would be 7.4. When there is a doubling of carbon dioxide concentration, pH would be 6.1 plus log 24 by 2.4 and that would be 7.1. Increase in arterial carbon dioxide will reduce arterial pH. 
a pH of 7.1 is very severe acidosis. If respiratory failure or ventilatory failure were to develop acutely, the resulting acidosis can even lead to death. If the reduction in ventilation were to happen gradually, then the kidneys can generate additional bicarbonate. Remember, this component of bicarbonate comes from the kidneys. They are there to buffer fixed acids as they are put out into blood from tissues. So, when kidneys increase their bicarbonate generation in response to the reducing pH, the henderson hasselbalch equation will tell us that pH can even normalize. But renal compensation is never complete. So, you might have some additional bicarbonate coming from the kidneys and the pH could be something like 7.32, which is still acidic, but not as bad as 7.1. To summarize what we have seen thus far, arterial blood has so much bicarbonate. The function of this bicarbonate is to buffer fixed acids as they come into blood. In order to prevent arterial blood from becoming too alkaline because of this bicarbonate, the lungs allow a certain amount of carbon dioxide to enter arterial blood. Ventilation in the normal circumstances is controlled precisely to maintain PCO2 at a certain level in the alveolus and therefore in arterial blood so as to maintain the pH of arterial blood at 7.4. In resting conditions, there is a certain amount of carbon dioxide formed from tissues and that carbon dioxide is added to venous blood. So, in venous blood, you have the bicarbonate coming from arterial blood plus the bicarbonate formed from this carbon dioxide. There is also some free carbon dioxide dissolved here, which is added to the free carbon dioxide that comes from arterial blood. But all of this is completely eliminated in the lungs. If alveolar ventilation reduces, then PCO2 concentration will increase in arterial blood. The kidneys may compensate by increasing the bicarbonate output. Therefore, any reduction in pH can be minimized. However, a primary reduction in ventilation causing an increase in PCO2 is termed respiratory acidosis and if the PCO2 is more than 50 millimeters mercury, it will be called respiratory failure, type 2 respiratory failure. There is another condition where both arterial PCO2 and arterial bicarbonate will be high, there the primary reason is an increase in bicarbonate because the kidneys are generating more bicarbonate due to some pathological state. And the lungs will reduce ventilation to increase carbon dioxide concentration in arterial blood so as to reduce the increase in pH. Now, this condition where there is a primary increase in bicarbonate compensated for by an increase in PCO2 is metabolic alkalosis with respiratory compensation. Now, this is to know some terms. PCO2 between 35 and 45 millimeter mercury is termed normocarbia. Any increase in PCO2 above 45 millimeters mercury in arterial blood can be called as hypercarbia. This happens only in ventilatory impairment or hypoventilation. It can cause, it will cause respiratory acidosis. And if the increase in carbon dioxide in arterial blood is more than 50 millimeter mercury, we will use the term respiratory failure or ventilatory failure. This is type 2 respiratory failure. If carbon dioxide concentration is less than 35 millimeter mercury, we will call it hypocarbia and it can lead to respiratory alkalosis if not compensated for by a comparative reduction in arterial bicarbonate. We also have to keep in mind that 
This picture of hypercarbia can also occur as a compensation to metabolic alkalosis where the lungs are actually compensating for a problem elsewhere. The hypercarbia in that state should not be thought of as respiratory failure. In the same vein, hypocarbia can occur as compensation to metabolic acidosis. We should now understand that ventilatory failure or a reduction in ventilation can cause hypercarbia. Any carbon dioxide concentration in the arterial blood more than 45 millimeter mercury can be thought of as hypercarbia and if it is higher than 50, we call it type 2 respiratory failure. The question now is, apart from ventilatory failure, can there be other causes for hypercarbia? One of them we know, metabolic alkalosis. If there is a primary increase in bicarbonate in blood due to a renal pathology, the lungs can compensate by reducing ventilation and therefore increasing carbon dioxide. But that hypercarbia in metabolic alkalosis is not respiratory failure. The lungs are actually helping out in metabolic alkalosis. And that's why you have the hypercarbia in an attempt to minimize the pH change. So apart from these two states that we know of, that is a reduction in ventilation and metabolic alkalosis, can there be other possible causes of hypercarbia? How do we make this analysis? Let us look at carbon dioxide transport. The tissues are putting out a certain amount of carbon dioxide and the red blood cells are converting it to bicarbonate so that you do not have an undue increase in dissolved carbon dioxide in blood. And in pulmonary capillaries, the carbon dioxide is reformed. It has to cross the diffusion membrane composed of the capillary endothelium and the alveolar epithelium. It has to cross the diffusion barrier and enter the lungs. And finally, ventilation will remove the carbon dioxide from the lungs. This is the series of phenomena that happen to remove the metabolically formed carbon dioxide. Can there be a defect at any one of these points which can lead to an increase in arterial PCO2? First of all, can there be an increase in formation of carbon dioxide or whatever carbon dioxide is formed, is there a defect in red blood cells that the carbon dioxide cannot be handled adequately? For example, in severe anemia, will there be a problem in red blood cell handling of carbon dioxide or can there be a problem at the diffusion membrane, a thickening of the diffusion barrier, a thickening of the alveolar epithelium as in fibrosis or COVID pneumonia for example, will that affect carbon dioxide diffusion and ultimately when there is reduced ventilation, will there be an increase in alveolar PCO2. This we know does happen in ventilatory impairment, there is an increase in alveolar PCO2 and therefore an increase in arterial PCO2 that we know already. Now we will consider these other issues, what happens when there is an increase in the amount of carbon dioxide formed in tissues? When can this happen? It can happen during exercise, but exercise is never a cause of hypercarbia because whatever excess is formed can be adequately handled if ventilation is not impaired. Now this other condition, malignant hypothermia, it is an anesthetic accident which happens when volatile anesthetics are administered to a patient who has to undergo surgery if the patient has a certain genetic predisposition. In malignant hypothermia, there is an uncontrolled calcium release in muscles and therefore an uncontrolled skeletal muscle contraction leading to hypothermia. Carbon dioxide concentration will also increase. And that can definitely lead to hypercarbia because this whole system will not be able to handle that excess carbon dioxide. So yes, there can be an increased formation in tissues leading to hypercarbia as in malignant hypothermia. What about the ability of red cells to handle carbon dioxide? Even in severe anemia, the red cell mechanism is adequate to handle whatever carbon dioxide may be formed. So that is never a cause of hypercarbia. There is no hypercarbia 
in anemia, for example. A problem here in the lungs where there is, let us say, a thickening of the alveolar epithelium, will there be a diffusion problem and therefore will arterial carbon dioxide increase? Now, this is a very important question to consider and is at the core of respiratory physiology. What we have to understand is that carbon dioxide elimination or carbon dioxide transfer from blood to lungs is not affected even if there is a thickening of the diffusion barrier. This is a very important lesson and we will consider this yet again when we consider diffusion. That leaves us with only two conditions where arterial carbon dioxide can go up, malignant hypothermia and ventilatory impairment. Now, this is a rare condition and if we leave that out, we are left with ventilatory impairment as the only cause of hypercarbia. This is a very important lesson in respiratory physiology. If you find that arterial carbon dioxide has gone up, you must understand that ventilation has reduced. We will now consider hypercarbia in the framework that we know of already in the context of hypoxia. Remember this mnemonic hash for conditions where the total amount of oxygen delivered to tissues is less. Tissue hypoxia. Of that, H stands for hypoxic hypoxia where arterial PO2 is less and therefore the amount of oxygen delivered to tissues is less. And when we looked at the causes of hypoxic hypoxia, we had this mnemonic, ventilation failure, atmospheric hypoxia, diffusion impairment and extrapulmonary shunts. <coughs> so, in this table, in these conditions, there is arterial hypoxia, reduced PO2, whereas in these conditions, though the amount of oxygen carried in blood and therefore delivered to tissues is less, there is no arterial hypoxia. We have seen all that earlier. Let us look at arterial carbon dioxide in this framework. Just now, we saw that in diffusion impairment, carbon dioxide can be normal or even low. So, in all these conditions, arterial carbon dioxide is normal and only in ventilatory impairment, arterial carbon dioxide is higher. So, let us keep analyzing these conditions in different ways. Hypoxia occurs in ventilatory impairment, atmospheric hypoxia, diffusion impairment and extrapulmonary shunt. Of that, only in ventilatory impairment, hypoxia is associated with hypercarbia. That is what we will refer to as type 2 respiratory failure. Whereas, in these two conditions, <coughs> The lungs are normal, the respiratory system is normal and therefore the hypoxia will stimulate ventilation resulting in even hypocarbia. This is what we refer to as type 1 respiratory failure. Now, in addition to ventilatory failure, there are some situations where there can be hypercarbia. We know of malignant hypothermia, metabolic alkalosis add on atmospheric hypercarbia as in situations where there is smoke for example. When there is so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it will enter the alveolus and therefore arterial carbon dioxide will also go up. So, that could be the mnemonic for hypercarbia. Whenever there is hypercarbia in blood, there will be hypoxia. We will see why as we consider the alveolar gas equation in the next lecture. We have already considered the alveolar ventilation equation which taught us that when ventilation reduces, the volume of carbon dioxide exhaled will not change, but the concentration of arterial carbon dioxide will increase. The other equation that I refer to now, alveolar gas equation is something else and we will consider that in the next lecture. This paper is just to impress upon you that metabolic alkalosis can cause significant compensatory hypercarbia which can also result in hypoxia. 
Okay, so this is the same thing. In metabolic alkalosis, it is alkalosis and the hypercarbia is actually a respiratory compensation. Whereas in these three conditions, there is acidosis, pH of blood will be lower. So if you want to think about respiratory acidosis, the possible causes are ventilatory failure, smoke or malignant hypothermia. As I said, these are rarer conditions and there will definitely be a history this therefore is the only important clinical scenario which you should be aware of which leads to respiratory acidosis and type 2 respiratory failure. In these two conditions you actually get a respiratory alkalosis. Okay, This is again the same framework. Type 2 respiratory failure occurs in ventilatory failure which causes hypoxia and hypercarbia whereas in diffusion impairment you will get a type 1 respiratory failure where there is hypoxia but no hypercarbia. In fact, carbon dioxide can even be lower. There can be hypocarbia and a respiratory alkalosis. Now, these two situations, atmospheric hypoxia and extrapulmonary shunt. The ABG profile will be similar to type 1 respiratory failure. But generally, we speak of these conditions also as leading to type 1 respiratory failure. But if you want to be careful in using the term respiratory failure, in atmospheric hypoxia, the lungs are normal. So, it is not fair to call it respiratory failure. Just that the arterial blood gas profile resembles type 1 respiratory failure. If you want to extend the same kind of analysis here, type 2 respiratory failure is only due to ventilatory failure. Whereas in these other cases, ABG profile for oxygen and carbon dioxide will resemble type 2 failure. However, remember in these two conditions, there will be acidosis as well as this, but in this condition, there is alkalosis, pH of blood will be higher. Thank you for watching.